So, because, so today I'm going to talk about easy development of your own chatbot with Flask and fine-tuned GPT model. So the key word in this talk are Flask, chatbot, and GPT model. So the text on this slide is too, too small to see, so please view the slides using this QR code. So if you have any question after PyCon, feel free to ask on Twitter or in person. So these images represent uh, per personas similar to myself, like shadow clans, like Kage Bunshin no Jutsu. So this talk is for beginners in AI, ML, like, um, uh, like honestly, I was not interested in, in LLMs until recently. So it's not mainly for AI ML experts or those already using AI ML in their work. The focus is on simplicity using just one Python module and one HTML file. So AI ML is a rapidly changing field with a lot of te technical terms. So I'll emphasize understanding the basics and key development principles. So by the end, you'll be ready to create your own chatbot clone. Today's agenda includes an overview of recent trends, understanding the workflow of LLM product development, creating chatbot application using Flask and GPT models, evaluating and fine tuning the GPT model, and then wrap up evaluation, comparing the GPT model before and after fine tuning, along with effects of memory. <coughs> so, first, let me provide some inputs about key terms of this talk. As you already know, conventional chatbots were efficient at basic tasks and quick replies, but struggle with complex pro problems and emotional understanding. So generative AI is overcoming these issues. Some people say that chatbot and generative AI may take over 80% jobs. They also complain that ChatGPT is not always trustful or reliable. However, the, real the reality is not that straightforward. So look at this chart. On the right from Goldman Sachs, it shows how older inventions like personal computers and the cars affected how much work people could do. So you can see how things consistently got better, but there is no clear sign of sudden AI boom. So from this chart, I think the big AI boom has not happened yet, but a change as big as that one caused by cars and the personal computers is likely to happen like we likely to use them in our daily life. So engineers will lead these changes. So now is a great time to learn about AI. Starting with chatbot is a really good way to begin learning about this topic. So listening to this talk is definitely worth your time. So next for those unfamiliar with Flask, I'll briefly explain its current version status. This slide is directly taken from the release notes. For more details, please check the release notes. So I just mentioned the key points. <clears throat> the latest version, uh, the latest major version of Flask is now up to 3.0. In this application, we'll be using Flask 3.0 and Python 3.11. My impression from the changes has not major alternations. So the most important thing to note is that it supports Python version from, from 3.8 to 3.12. So that's all you need to know for now. In this slide, in this slide, we're gonna get on the same page by breaking down and understanding some key terms. So ChatGPT is a web application with limited access to OpenAI's API, handling text, images, and audio, and allowing customization for specific tasks. Older versions like 3.5 are free, while newer ones need a subscription. The OpenAI APIs, including GPT, is similar to ChatGPT, but handling single interactions and does not store chat history. And cost vary based on usage, which is pay-as-you-go model. On the other hand, RAG combines information retrieval with text generation, useful for tasks requiring up-to-date knowledge. So fine-tuned GPT models are adjusted for specific tasks with additional training for better performance in certain areas. So RAG is useful uh, external information, while the fine-tuned models excel in specialized tasks. So some projects uh, may use long chain for RAG, but fine-tuning fine with latest data makes RAG unnecessary. So this talk 
focuses on using fine-tuned models. So next quickly, let me explain LLM product development workflow. The basic workflow moves from left to right, while it's crucial to clarify the problem you want to solve before starting development. We typically begin with selecting foundation model or preparing the data set for training and evaluation. Next comes to prompt engineering followed by assessment. If the solution still does not meet the desired accuracy, we proceed with fine tuning and further evaluations. So as we iterate through the, this cycle and reach a production ready stage, we can either deploy the model as an API or save it as an object to be loaded by a web application. Alternatively, we might integrate the inference model directly into a web application deploy the, and deploy the entire application. So the deployment strategy should be chosen based on the individual objectives and circumstances. So in this talk, we will only focus on the middle line of development and I will not cover deployment. Now let's go through the features we are going to build and I'll explain how to create them step by step. I demonstrate an application where each functionality is incrementally added. And we go through the code together to understand how it's done. So now more hard to see the tech is, so now view the slides from this QR code. So I've created a brief table outlining key of uh, general chatbot features, conversational management, uh, ensures smooth chat and relevant responses, moderate difficult, uh, but very important. Information retrieval uh, gathers data from external sources for converse conversation use. So intent recognition is critical for understanding user intention, but it's challenging to Im implement. So response generation creates chatbot replies and it's tough and about essential to implement. So I'll skip the explanation about user interface, multilingual support and database integration are usually incorporated at basic functionalities. <coughs> so the minimum features needed to build chatbot are marked in red. I will be implementing these red sections using Python and Flask. For the parts not in red, the GPT model will be used to fill in the gaps. So this is the overview of Flask chatbot features with part using the GPT model highlighted in blue. You need to call to connect with uh, OpenAI API and OpenAI account, which is not covered here. So see OpenAI's website for details. So we are skipping imp implementation of information retrieval by fine tuning. The GPT model is much longer multilingual capabilities eliminate the need for separate multilingual support. So database integration is unnecessary as OpenAI handles account man management with API registration. So by approaching it this way, the implementation difficulty becomes much easier. So for, for those using a long chain, I've detailed using its features for chatbot functionalities in the table. But in this fast chatbot project, I only use the Python-based OpenAI client library, not Langchain. So due to uh, model fine-tuning fine with a new data set and no need for external application integration. So in my view, Langchain is a great resource for learning about the LLM trend, but sometimes there are various functionalities seems to be too much. So, and also the OpenAI Assistant API Currently in beta offers uh, threatening functions for managing, assi managing assistant user chat by storing message history so that you will not need to implement them by yourself in your future. So for more details, I refer to OpenAI's uh, official document. So next, uh, let's move on to the future deployment step by step. So this is the chatbot with the minimum necessary features implemented it uh, it, sim it, simplify, it simply uh, makes requests to get the GPT 3.5 Turbo API and displays the responses. Uh, since API is stateless, sending the same prompt will result in the same reply. This chatbot does not have memory. It does not consider past conversations when responding. So when given abstract sentences, there's a delay in response time. Um, 
However, it can uh, predict it, it can predict and understand my uh, intentions even with misspelled uh, English words and response accordingly. So similar to chatbot, chat GPT, it also supports uh, Thai languages. So it takes time to respond. <coughs> yeah, now we got long sentences. So now uh, here's the code from our last demo. On the left, uh, we have part of the Python code, and on the right, the complete HTML code. So when someone visits the website, Rask uses uh, render template and the request functions. So request function is important for dealing with data from users, like form inputs. So in Flask, request context is made for each web request. So this context, uh, let's, let's uh, variables like request to be used globally in that request and thread. So ensuring safe and effective handling. So when the form submit button is clicked, the server-side server side rendering starts. It uses the request context to securely process user input, then the user's input and the GPT model's reply uh, generated by the get response function are shown on the current side. So this is possible because of the request function's ability to handle incoming data and context. So now let, let's look more closely at how the get response function works in the setup. The zip code on line 28 is where we actually make a request to the OpenAI API specifying the GPT 3.5 turbo model. The messages variable uh, contains the prompt and the max token is set to 3000, dictating the maximum length of the response. Uh, the temperature parameter controls the variety in responses. The specific model is defined in model argument. So the HTML on the right side has not changed from the previous slide. The current UX and the UI of Flask's chatbot are quite basic, so we decorate it more. <laughs> so I made some improvement to the UI. Now there's a drop-down menu that allows for the selection of different models. It displays a list of, the, list of all the GPT models currently offered by OpenAI, OpenAI API. So for, so for longer text, you notice that the response uh, appears uh, character by character, uh, making it seem more responsive. Uh, this is achieved through the implementation of OpenAI API's streaming feature. So there was a typo in uh, pronunciation from a previous answers, but API managed to predict and respond appropriately. Uh, demonstrating how it can generate uh, different responses to even with a single character change. So except for this, uh, the responses remain consistent. So, and just like before, if the same prompt is sent, uh, it results in the same response. So for example, in response to hi and how can I uh, assist you? Then same response return it. So on the left side, we have the Python code from the previous uh, basic functional Flask chatbot demo. And on the right side, on the right is the Python code of Flask chatbot with a streamlined UI. So I made the chat interface function more compact and split the functions to enable streaming in the subsequent code. When the page initially loads, it fetches the current time and the list of available GPT models. Then with some styling, it renders a drop-down menu component on the server side and displays it on the page. So these changes are streamlined uh, the user interface, making the chatbot more interactive and user-friendly while managing its core functionality. So in the code on line 41, setting a stream to true activate uh, the OpenAI API streaming feature, allowing the response to be received one character at a time. Lines 44 and 47 send uh, each character to the get response function, then to the client as a response object. So this streams characters to the client as they are live, beneficial for long responses, 
as it destroys content gradually. So streaming also helps identify where text generation might stop if there is an error. So now I implement a memory area for the bot. So it will also send the pass prompt submitted by the user along with the current API request. Unlike before, sending, sending hi and twice uh, does not result in the same response. Hello, how can I assist you today? Uh, instead, uh, the bot now reads the uh, context and responds with Sawadika. It seems it seems to um, have learned Thai. So even without specifying the object for mean by in the input, the bot is capable of uh, predicting and providing a suitable response. So now the responses change even when the same text is sent. So on the client side, the text data send is encrypted using a secret key on the server side and temporarily stored in the session object. Uh, which is then saved as a cookie in the browser, uh, preserving the chart history. I've also uh, written Python script to decrypt this data, which we can use to ch check what content is actually being stored. So you can see uh, this is the data uh, stored in the browser, uh, which means the past conversation of user input. So on the left is the Python code for Flask chatbot with Streamline UI. On the right, a chatbot with user memory uh, using Flask sessions. These sessions store data in the browser cookies for continuity across requests. So this session, encrypted with a secret key, holds a conversation dictionary initialized at line nine and updated by update conversation history function. The key set at line four encrypts session data stored temporarily in the browser. So Flask sessions keep data current side as suitable for non-sensitive information, but avoid using them for confidential data to pre prevent exposure. In the update conversation history function code, uh, Flask session is a threat safe global object accessible in each request. We use it to save user send text from the request into the conversation session by marking session.modify equal true, we tell Flask the session has changed, so ensuring it sends updated session data in the client browser's response. So next, uh, we'll store both the users and the bot's past conversation in the session. So now the bot also remembers its responses. Uh, when we resend the same prompt, uh, the bot path replies are included, and then change the response. So as the prompts uh, accumulate, uh, responses become more detailed and longer. So we can see the past conversations of users and the bots. Uh, on the browser session. So here you go. Um, <coughs> so on the left, uh, we see the Python code for the Flask chatbot uh, with user memory. On the right, it's a code for chatbot with both user and the bot, bot memory. So there are two key updates. Uh, first, I added validator for JSON data in a request and cookie session data using a decorator needed due to uh, more endpoints handling requests. So second, uh, we tackle the issues of not accessing session data during data transmission with yield. A uh, new endpoint for updating session data was created to solve this. So when the user submitted text, it's added to the conversation history and send with the pass logs to the OpenAI API. The API's response is streamed to the client in real time. After the full, full response is sent, both user and the bot text are saved in the session's conversation history. Additionally, uh, and additionally, the, I've used the quick command for either execution in order to handle decrypt session function on the console with Flask command use. 
So let's look at the Flask chatbot with just user memory, and then the ones with user and the bot memory. In the first, it only uses a user's pass chat as a prompt, but in the second, it uses all the chat, even the uh, bot replies. Uh, this makes the bot see a second high differently. Uh, in the first, it's just hello. But uh, in the second, the bot thinks it's asking for help, so different meanings. So both approaches uh, work well, uh, generally the more specific, the more prompt, the better the, the responses, but it's not always that simple. So that's where prompt engineering gets tricky. So you've got to figure out how much and what kind of info to put in the prompts. Moreover, it's necessary to continuously evaluate and iterate on this process. So actually, we could stop development here, but uh, I want to create a more practical bot. So to do this, uh, we'll evaluate and fine tune the model, aiming to uh, develop a more specialized bot. So again, so super hard to see the tech, so just in case, um, I'll show you the QR code. So I'm creating the bot uh, specialized in second language acquisition methods for learning Thai by fine-tuning GPT Turbo. First, um, I will compare GPT 3.5 Turbo and GPT uh, 4 Turbo, uh, which is also called as GPT 4 Preview 11 or 6 to understand their differences. So I don't understand a long Thai sentences, uh, so I'm going to ask the same question to the latest GPT 4 model. So GPT-4 uh, provides the detailed answers, but the, they can be a bit lengthy. So GPT-3.4 Turbo responds along uh, uh, sentences in Thai, and I will ask the same question to GPT-4, GPT-4, uh, GPT Turbo 4, and the response correctly in English. <coughs> but uh, I'm aiming for concise and accurate answers in a single attempt. So in contrast, GBD 3.5 did not respond in English to my question. So to get both accurate and concise answers, so I'll balance uh, between GBD 3.5 Turbo and GBD 4 Turbo, aiming for GBD 4 Turbo's performance at lower cost. So this topic is quite challenging and take us a bit away from Python and the Flask. So learning more to data science and LLMs. So I'll compare GPT 3.5 Turbo and GPT 4 Turbo using the same prompt in the memory less bot setup. So I'll use the GPT 4 Turbo to, to prepare data for evaluating and fine tuning GPT 3.5 Turbo. Then we'll check the model's performance before and after fine tuning. In this part, we are evaluating our models using reliability and validity. They are like precision, uh, precision and recall in natural science area. So reliability means getting similar answers for similar prompts, showing consistency, not necessary accuracy. Validity is about getting accurate answers for different prompts, focusing on accuracy, not consistency. So these concepts are more common in fields with human subjects like cognitive science or medicine, not so much in natural sciences. So the diagram to the left, often seen in social science books, uh, explains reliability and validity with four targets, each with a low shot. So top left is unreliable and invalid, where answers are neither reproducible nor accurate. Top right is um, reliable but varied, uh, which accurate but inconsistent answers. Bottom left is reliable, not valid, showing consistent but inaccurate responses. The so bottom right, uh, both reliable and varied, is all aim. So where answers are both accurate and con consistent. So our goal here is to refine our GPT models to reach this ideal, both reliable and valid state. The evaluation plan is 
in three parts ABC using the LLM as judge concept and OpenAI's recommended eval framework. So first, we are using GPT-4 1106 preview model as our benchmark, the model from the demo video. So for the prompt dataset, assessing reliability involves, ten, reliability involves 10 set of questions with consistent proper and relevant nouns, ensuring uh, reliable responses. For validity, each set of 10 questions will have distinct nouns testing accurate responses to valid queries. So we'll compare GPT 3.5 Turbo's accuracy before and after fine tuning using prompts from GPT 4 Turbo. So accuracy for both reliability and validity, validity will be uh, judged based on the presence of keywords in the responses, measuring the fine tuned model's effectiveness in handling diverse, diverse prompts. So in our reliability prompt dataset, I've picked two examples from 10 sets. These open-ended prompts are crafted to get responses with certain specific words I chose. So these specific words are in every answer. I made a prompt to get answer with these words. Uh, relevant words may or may not appear in the answers. I did not use questions that always have relevant words to avoid nearly identical questions and answers, which would make it hard to tell the tell the data set apart. So in the validity prompt data set, I've taken two examples from 10 sets. Uh, these ask um, GPT-4 Turbo for specific prompts about second language acquisition offering valid views. So GPT-4 Turbo generated both specific and relevant words. Each set has different specific words always included in answer. Like the reliability data set, relevant words might or might not be appear in answers, but with more specific prompts uh, and answers, these words are often in included and more focused. For example, uh, abstract concepts cover a wide range of meanings, so while the specific concepts have a narrower, more focused scope. So let's review how GPT-3.5 Turbo responds to prompts made by GPT-4 Turbo, so the responses from GPT-3 Turbo are longer, probably because they lack context. So in the left example, the accuracy is 0 0.25, and in the right, it's 0 0.125. Overall, GPT 3.5 turbo accuracy with the reliability prompt data set is low at 0 0.3125. So GPT 4 turbo's <coughs> responses show a wider variety of words. So like before, let's check how GPT-3 Turbo responds to GPT-4 Turbo's prompts for validity. Again, GPT-3 Turbo's responses are longer, probably due to the lack of context. Uh, in, the t in the left example, accuracy is 0 0.7. In the right, it's 0 0.2. Overall, GPT-3.5 Turbo's accuracy for the validity data set is relatively low at 0 0.46. So notably, the left side prompt response is as accuracy as GPT fours. So we're gonna fine tune GPT 3.5 Turbo with uh, 13 prompt sets of all with an accuracy under 0 0.5. And these sets will be our training data. So the left side shows our training data set. User represents evaluation prompt and assistant shows correct GPT 4 responses. On the right, you see the training execution code the training is done on OpenAI's platform and the status will be changed successful once finished. So you can check this status with OpenAI library or on the playground page. So this fine tuning process is simpler than implementing a rug. Let's look at how GPT 3.5 Turbo responses to the reliability prompt, uh, prompt uh, changed with, with fine tuning. Before fine tuning, uh, GPT 3.5 Turbo's responses shown on the left are longer. After fine tuning on the right, they're much shorter and include keywords, more keywords, making them both precise and concise. So the accuracy also improved going from 0 0.25 to 0 0.65. For the second sample comparisons, like the first responses are now much shorter and included keywords enhancing precision and conciseness Accuracy improved from 0 0.125 to 0 
with total average accuracy increasing from 0.3 to 0.5. This makes a significant improvement in terms of reliability. So now comparing GPT 3.5 tables responses to the variety prompt, prompt before and after fine tuning. In the first uh, sample, responses are shorter, but our accuracy has not changed. Uh, notably, the answer now more similar to those from GPT-4 table. So for, second, for the second sample comparison, the responses have become much shorter and now include crucial keywords, uh, enhancing the conciseness and accuracy. The accuracy arose from 0 0.2 to 0 0.6, but the total average accuracy only slightly increased from 0 0.46 to 0 0.45, 0 .0 .0 0.48. While the validity did not improve significantly, but the responses are shorter. So for future work, uh, we could add metrics that measure response lengths for more detailed evaluation. So lastly, uh, we'll test the improved GPT models through chatbot application. This will show us how the improvement affect real world interactions, giving us practical view of all enhancement. So on the left is the fine tuned GPT 3.5 table, and on the right, the pre-fine pre tuned version. The loudest response are too wrong. So you can see later, possibly harming the user experience and increasing churn rate. So, you can see the differences between the uh, fine tuned model and the pre-fine tuned model longer response, it's, it's a bit lengthy and redundant. So I'm going to skip. Too much lengthy, yeah. So comparing the fine-tuned GPT 3.5 table with the version that has user and the bot memory, there is a little difference. It's better to fine tune for accurate, um, accurate uh, first attempt responses than to use the past conversations for prompt engineering. So not, there are not big differences between the uh, fine tune GPT uh, 3.5 table uh, without memories and with memories. So I recommend postponing the implementation of conversational management Plus, OpenAI's API will soon support conversational management, making session management less necessary. So starting with a simple code, I show in basic functional of Flask chatbot and possibly adding Terrawind or CSS, so using some front-end framework and combining back-end front-end and coding and deploying or some paths. Uh, it can be a good another option. So yeah, uh, so now my Crohn's uh, allows me to finish my talk. So yes, um, it's time to wrap up, so thank you.